marketing into my head. And after that, we had an event in Vancouver and he flew me out. And this is with our mastermind. So people who have paid a significant amount of money to work with us. And again, I am terrified. Not only am I terrified, I'm naturally a little awkward and I am clumsy, right? So I go up to Vancouver and I'm like, all right, just be calm. It's fine, it's fine. So I walk in and, you know, mom's like, hey, it's really nice to meet you in person. And we have a stock and he's like, hey, there's some chairs over there. Can you just put them around the table? I'm like, yes, absolutely. So I go and I lift these chairs up the table or off the like stack of chairs and it slips out of my hand and hits me in the face and gives me a black eye. I'm in Canada now with a black eye. First day of the first job, like in person. And I'm just like, how? Of course, this is something I did. So then Amon walks back in and he's about to get up on stage and teach. And he looks at me and he's like, how? But he doesn't have time for me to explain. So he, he spends the entire morning just looking at me as my eye is getting bigger and blacker and bigger and blacker. And then he tells a story and then I cry and I, I, I messes up the makeup that I put on. Oh, it was a disaster. But afterwards, when we had an opportunity to talk and I told him what happened, he looked at me and laughed and he's like, okay, so just you're banned from touching sharp, sharp objects. And I was like, that is fair. And I don't think I've ever touched a knife when we're setting up an event since. And that night, him and I sat down and we built out another mastermind. And then when I flew back, which by the way, I was stopped at the border and like they thought that I had actually gotten beaten up. Uh, but when I flew back, we spent a significant amount of time and he continued to show up for me over and over and every day and every day. I fit, spent the two, first two years with Success Road Academy learning what it meant to be in digital marketing. But then like every story, there's always a piece. There's always that thing that's nagging at you, that's still in your head. And for me, that was speaking, right? Like, this is amazing. I love everything I'm doing. I love showing up to work but I'm not speaking. And isn't that what I wanted? Isn't that the piece of who I was, right? So I had a couple talks with him on about it and he's like, yeah, like, absolutely. He taught me how to be a public speaker. He helped me hone my skills. And then he calls me up one day and says, hey, if you had the opportunity to be a TEDx speaker or a TEDx organizer, what would you choose? And I say organizer without even thinking about it. And he goes, cool. Here's what you have to do. I'll put you in touch with Roger Killen, who was the organizer of TEDx, Stanley Park, and apply. And you can be an organizer. And I was like, what? I was like, okay, well, you just made that sound ridiculously easy. And it was not. In my journey to TEDx, uh, to Nea Paseo, which was my TEDx event I produced with 24 speakers and two entertainment acts, live streamed over 12 hours, started there. Through COVID, we had all of the changes had happened in January, 2021. And this was the moment that I pieced in that last piece of the puzzle of what it means to be a public speaker, what it means to work with high level speakers and the impact of a TEDx talk. And after that event, it occurred to me that you don't have to have the TEDx brand. You don't have to be on the TEDx stage to make an impact on the stage, to really get your idea out, to show the world that there is so much more than just the status quo. So I worked with my TEDx speakers, but then I also followed up with them and I wanted to know more. I wanted to know what they were doing in their business, how they were utilizing the, their talks, all of those things. I started getting in touch with other people in the industry who did paid speaking gigs, right? I started to study kind of what they did. And I combined all of it and started really looking at what we're calling a TEDx style talk, but at its core, it's a credibility talk. It's not when you sell from stage, maybe you're getting paid to give it, which is awesome, uh, but it's something that shows your credibility in a certain area of expertise you have that is not related to your business. Now, there's a couple things about these talks because most entrepreneurs are very used to their content. They know their stuff. They get up there and they can talk for the next hour and a half in whatever their business is about. And that is great. But what if you're not trying to get people to buy into your business? What, right? What if 
You just want them to take action to make their lives or the world better. What does that actually look like? And these talks are so powerful and so important for you as a speaker and for you as an entrepreneur. I said that TEDx wasn't the only stage that you see these on. Associations ask for these talks all the time. So do universities, right? So do places and groups that have an audience that they're trying to help get a message out. We see this over and over and over again. Places that are not business focused, they're community focused. And these kind of talks can draw your reputation and make it bigger and more powerful, which ultimately drives to your business anyway, than you can ever imagine. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about what does that mean? How to create structure, a really good credibility talk and how to find these opportunities and how to really take that opportunity and then push it towards your business. So first we're gonna go over how to prepare and structure a talk. This is probably one of my favorite things ever because on its surface, it seems really easy, but it's so much more complicated than it seems. Uh, because there's so many nuances in how we say things, right? How we frame things and how people perceive them. So the first thing is that you always want to start with your why. And we hear this a lot, right? Like, raise your hand if you've not heard start with your why about a gazillion times. Here is the thing. Starting with your why gives you something which I call emotional credibility. Everyone ever wants to understand, oh, my screen just started flipping out. Everyone ever wants to understand why you do the thing you do. What me, makes you an expert? What like gives you credibility in the world, right? So you always start by answering that question. This is why you should listen to what I'm saying because I have been through this experience because I have done this research because this is who I am and this is what makes me an expert. Now in a credibility talk, it's about a third of your talk, right? We don't spend a lot of time on our story because it is not something we're pushing with emotion. This talk is pushed much more by fact and circumstance and outside validation. And I'll explain that in a minute, but always start with your why, right? So if someone asks that question, you can answer them. Next, every uh, credibility talk goes with a universal message. What does that mean? Well, when we sell, we always say the money's in the niche. Niche? I can never say that word, right? But here, we're trying to reach a wider group of people. We want a message that's going to appeal to a wider group of people. It solves a problem, either a community problem or a global problem, but it is a problem we are solving. So if your problem is very, 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 very specific, you have less people you're going to be able to relate to or that are going to relate to you. And that creates a problem when you're creating credibility around your message. Next, external support. So you open the talk with, well, what is your why, right? But then what do you have to support that? Now, this is my favorite because everyone says, oh, you need statistics, you need science, and that is great. Don't get me wrong, I love me some science. But there are people out there with stories. Like there are people out there who have experiences that are similar to yours, right? So if you can find these people and you can reference them and you can show that there's a pattern, that there's a pattern that leads to a problem and it's all anecdotal, great but it has to be something that's not you. So if you have a series of people, if you have science, if you have statistics, wonderful, use it. You need external support. Next is the call to action. This is real easy one when you're selling, right? Like, hey, book an appointment with me or hey, go to my website and buy this thing that is my business. That's really easy. But what does a call to, support, or a call to action look like in a credibility talk? you are challenging the audience to take a step outside of their comfort zone to make this problem go away, right? So there is a TEDx talk where a guy, it's like five minutes, five or six minutes long, but he literally teaches people how to wash their hands using one paper towel. 
Well, why? Because if you use one paper towel when you dry your hands and everybody does that, then less trees are chopped down, right? We do more for the environment. And in turn, we're supporting the environment, right? But his call to action is, hey, when you go wash your hands, use one paper towel. And he's showing you why you should do that. So your call to action is a step people can take to help this problem disappear. And that is your pers persuasion. That is absolutely why you want people to move on what you're saying. And your why and your universal message and your external support and all of these things all come down to what is that challenge? What is that action? So know that. Know that step you want people to take and make everything else support it. All right, next. Those are the how you should kind of structure your talk. But there's some kind of really important things that you need to consider when you're putting this talk together, right? The first is authenticity. If I could scream this from the rooftops, I would. Here's the thing is old school speaking had this idea that our audience was stupid. The way that people would teach speaking is tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, then tell them what you've told them. Super condescending. Audiences are smarter than that. Audiences know when you're not being authentic. They know when you're faking it. They know when you don't know what you're saying. They always know. And you never, ever want to make the assumption that your audience is not smart. So come from a place of authenticity. You do yourself like no favors by trying to be something you're not. So do that in how you write it. Do that in how you show up on stage. Do that in your interactions with the audience. Everything you should say should be authentic. And that gives you the power to internalize your talk and not memorize it. So what do I mean by that? Just like I said, that business owners know their content and can talk forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, it's because they've internalized it. Same thing with your credibility talk. Write it out, know what you're gonna say, but at your core, in your soul, know that talk. Get up and say it. Say it with your soul and everything that you have in you because memorizing only gets you so far. When your brain blinks, you need your heart to pick up on it and go, I got you. And you continue your talk. Don't rely on only your brain to produce a good talk. Next, your credibility talk should always be timeless. It should be something that you know you'll be proud of in 10 years. This is harder because we change, the world changes, so many things change, right? But if you're looking at that universal message, there have been some that have gone through thousands of years, right? As people, as civilizations, we are always battling almost the same thing. So think about that when you're creating your universal message. How can you make this timeless? Now, it is okay if you reference dates, right? It is okay if you have to talk about something that happened in history. You know, the, the most used one for us is a pandemic. Lots of people like to reference it. Well, guess what? That was a super impactful time for so many people. So many people's lives changed. And the pandemic became the why. Why did you have to pivot? Why did you have to do the thing you did? So yeah, it's okay to reference it because it's part of your why. But don't use it as a justification of the entire talk because in 10 years, people are going to look at the pandemic and go, yeah, that was something that happened 10 years ago. And yes, it was an impact, but it's not going to be as much of an impact as it is now. So always make sure that your talks are timeless. And that goes for any major event in history, by the way, that just happens to be the closest one to us that's used the most. Next, don't rely on external sources. This is also something else that if I could scream from the rooftops, I would. If you notice, I don't have a PowerPoint because I hate them. I hate them. I hate being distracted by anything else that is not me talking. I want to have a connection with my audience. I want to internalize my talk. And I believe in those things. You will rarely see me with a PowerPoint. 
Does that mean that everyone should go without a PowerPoint? No, but what it does mean is your talk and your ability to deliver it with power and confidence should not rely on something like a PowerPoint because what happens if you don't have that projector, right? What happens if you can't load PowerPoint on your computer if it's virtual? Are you still able to do your talk? Yes, right? And if you are on a stage, confidence monitors is also something I hate. If you have those notes in front of you, yeah, they're great, absolutely. But you're not internalizing your message. You're relying on your brain to remember things from notes. Guys, this is who you are. This is who you are at your core. Know your message and don't rely on external things also that can distract you with your connection from the audience. Remember I said your audience is so much smarter than for a long time speakers assumed? If you break that connection and you stop and the clicker doesn't work or whatever happens, then your audience stops with you and you've lost them. So keep that in mind. All right, so what happens next, right? So you put together this talk that you're really proud of, you're really excited about, it is your creation. You're like, this is who I am, I cannot wait to get on stage. But here's the caveat. Talks, even when they're internalized, they are a living thing. The best advice I have is feedback. Get feedback from peers. Get feedback from people you think, like the kind of person you think might be in your audience. Get feedback from everybody, okay? This is how your talk becomes better. It is literally like feeding a pet, right? If you give it food and water, it grows. If you give your talk feedback, you can make it grow into something even better. So go and get feedback. Now, what happens if one person says one awful thing that's like just off the wall and doesn't make sense? Do you need to change your talk? No. But what you should be looking for are patterns. If 10 people say, don't use this word, it comes off wrong. Don't use that word, right? If five people are like, hey, this would just feel better if you frame this like this, well, change the framing. Because your ultimate goal is to reach out to as many people as possible. So you get as much feedback as you can, you start to look for the patterns in the feedback and you adjust your talk and you adjust your talk and you adjust your talk. Then you give your talk, right? And this is the talk that's on video. This is the talk on stage. Never assume this is the end all be all because if you've done it once, you can do it over and over again. So you watch your own talk. You give yourself feedback. You send your link to everybody you possibly can. Right? Not only are you getting yourself exposure, but you want to see how your audience is going to react to it. Then you get yourself on another stage to make the talk better. Feedback is that nutrients that your talk needs. Now, what happens when you have this thing that is like yours, right? And someone says something that's really mean because it happens. How do you deal with that? So we remove the emotion. And we look from the action item. And this takes practice, especially for people like myself who are very emotional about everything. You think about, okay, they said, if someone says, hey, you are being a jerk right now. Okay, well, if we take that aside and you just like, what's the action on that? I'm being a jerk. Okay, I'll try to be nicer. Like there's not really an action item there to fix it if it's just one off person, right? Now, if someone says, Hey, what you said really upset me and I don't like you, but I think it needs to be better. Okay, well, you don't like me and I'm really, really sorry about that, but let me look at what that said. Okay, I can see how that might hurt someone. Let me fix that, right? So you're taking away that emotion and you're looking at the action items. If you find yourself in a situation where people are giving you feedback in not a healthy way, keep that in mind. It's a living, breathing, growing thing your talk. You will always be working on it. Your next talk will be your best talk. And it is okay. Even the best speakers in the world do this. They never ever keep the same talk in the same way forever. Okay. So just keep that in the mind that it's always a process. All right. We're going to get to Q&A, but uh, we're going to actually stop here for one second because that was a lot about how to structure a talk. Does anyone have questions about that piece? No? 
Awesome. Okay, moving on. Where can you find these opportunities? Uh, so TEDx Sages. Let's let's actually start there because it's what's on everybody's mind all the time. How do you get on a TEDx stage? Number one, please do not email the organizer and tell them why you're the best speaker in the world because they will not read it. Organizers care so much more about their community and about the impact they're making. What they want is people to step up and be part of the experience. So if you were to apply to a TEDx stage blind, you actually have a higher chance of winning the lottery. Don't do it. Here's how you get around it. As you look up, for, as look up TEDx events, you email the organizer or you email people on the team. And you say, hey, I see your events in this town. I'm interested in being a TEDx speaker, but I would love to be there for the experience. Do you need any volunteers? How can I help you? Always start with how can I help? Because more than likely what's happening is you have a TEDx team that is overwhelmed. They're trying to do a million things at once. They're lacking volunteers and they could really use the help from someone who really wants to be there, right? So they say, sure, yes, we could use the help. Well, maybe you're not on that stage, but guess what? That TEDx organizer knows other organizers. And now you're in the community. And I promise you, organizers reach out to speakers that they know first. Even if they make them do an application, they reach out to speakers that they know first. So you start networking, right? And if that TEDx event happens the next year, you have an entire year to work on your talk and befriend the organizer and get feedback from higher level speakers. It is perfect. Guys, TEDx is a long game. Get in the community. Meet people who are organizers and other speakers. That is how you get in. Okay, treat it like that. In the meantime, come up with your talk. Work on it. Do it on other stages. I promise that that, that is your key. Gosh, I'm telling you, if I had people emailing me like, hey, can I help you? It would have been a game changer for me. Stay in those, those communities and also participate in as much as you can, as often as you can. So where else can you do this talk other than just the TEDx stage? Associations are great and they are always looking for speakers. It doesn't even matter what the association is about, like power or like utilities or nurses or doctors or whatever. You can actually go online and look up different associations in the United States, see if they do conventions and get a hold of the person who runs the convention and ask if they're looking for speakers. I promise most of them are, some of them go through bookers, but not everybody does. Do your research and find out. And associations usually pay. They won't tell you that up front, but they usually pay. So now your talk that's gonna give you credibility, you're getting paid for which is pretty cool. It's like my favorite thing in the world to get up on stage and get like 10K. Yes, please. All day, every day. So associations. Next are universities and colleges. Often they will have guest speakers speaking on different topics. Whatever your message and your topic is, contact the head of that department and say, hey, do you have anything coming up that you need guest speakers for? Maybe they do and maybe they don't, but universities and colleges is also a great, great place to do this. Next, there are a gazillion events out there, right? Expos, conventions, whatever, for a million different industries that are not necessarily associations, right? You see expos everywhere. Start asking where you can do your talk. Now, some of these places are more of a speak to sell situation and that is okay, but some of them have keynote speakers that they want. They want keynote speakers reach out again to the organizer and follow up. Now the associations, the universities, the college, the conferences and expos, you don't wanna just email. This is gonna be a, a slightly different approach. You're going to want to have what you call a speaker one sheet available. I also despise these, but they are absolutely required by the industry. 
and on that speaker one sheet, it's going to have all of your contact information, what you speak about, the name of your talk, any relevant information about you, like if you have a social following, um, if you've done anything important, if you've done other talks, just stuff like that. You can actually just Google speaker one sheets online and find one that you love. Put together a speaker one sheet. Then also have on like a Word document your contact information and the same things about your talk and all of that. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to email the organizer. You're going to attach your speaker one sheet. In the body of the email, you're going to say, hi, so-and-so, I saw that you were looking for speakers or I'm wondering if you're looking for speakers. Uh, this is my name. And you're going to copy that information, like your contact, all about your talk, in the body of the email. And also attach your speaker one sheet. Give them all the information ever. Then you're going to wait. Give them 48 hours to a week. If they do not respond to you, you're going to follow up with email one more time. Hey, just following up on this thing, you know, reaching out to see, you know, if you received it. Give them two days after that. If they have not responded, you're going to start calling people. Because here's the thing is it's always in the follow up. People don't ignore you because they're trying to ignore you. They ignore you because they're busy. Because like all of us, they have 500 things on their desk, in their inbox. They're trying to get through everything. And they may see you and be like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And then forget about you the next morning because they have all these tasks. So if you stay in their vision, you stay in their gravity, they're much more likely to hire you and bring you on their stage. I cannot tell you how many speakers I know who have gotten high level talks out of pure grit because they have followed up, they have followed through and they keep following up and following through. Do it over and over and over again. If you are passionate about developing this talk, you are passionate about giving it, you wanna give it on the high level stages, you wanna give it to TEDx, you wanna give it everywhere, understand that it will be work until you get your momentum going. And that is the cool thing, is one speaking gig can lead five more because people see you in the audience. They're like, wow. This person was amazing. How do we book them? And that happens as soon as you start to get momentum. So expect it to be a lot of work on the front end until that momentum is built and then speaking gigs will just happen. And you never say no to a microphone. Always keep that in mind. Take them, enjoy it, and really live, live, live that message because it can absolutely change your life. It can change your business which is interesting because how does a talk that doesn't drive to your business change your business? People Google you. People come up to you after the event. Hey, what do you actually do? Like, what do you do in real life? Oh, I own a digital marketing firm or I run networking groups or whatever, right? I'm a doctor. Here's my card. How? Let me give you my contact information. And it always benefits your business. And so keep that in mind that one thing benefits the other it's all about momentum. It's about getting that going. It's about following up and following through with a talk that you can give absolutely from your soul. And that is the thing that changes your trajectory personally. It changes your trajectory in business. It can change your entire outlook on how you go into the world. All right. Do we have questions on any of that? We can just go into full Q&A. Brenda, Keisha, can you unmute her? Hi, Sarah. Hi. Thank you so much. This is lots of great information. What I would like to know is what do you recommend when I've never spoken before on stage? And so people are saying or asking, well, what sort of information can you know can you show me something in which you've spoken to an audience before and I've never spoken to an audience before what do you what do you do so I would always suggest joining a speaking group first like whether that's Toastmasters or sometimes you can just find speaking groups who help each other even though it's a learning environment what that'll do is that'll put you on stage and then you can get video even if it's like on a, a, an iPhone you can get video of you doing these talks and then you can ask someone to just put them together and to have like a sizzle reel, right? If people don't know how many people are in the audience, 
Like they really don't. I actually do action talks right now for Action Era. We're doing a tour. And the whole purpose of the tour and getting people to do these credibility talks is so we can get them on video and they have an entire video. No one on the other side knows how many people are in the audience. It's a very, very powerful thing. So put yourself in places where you can be on any stage and then get video of it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Ron? All right, cool. Uh, awesome information as well. Very, very detailed. And uh, I don't think you used the PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, on step number three, I, I think it was step number three, it was like external support. And I wrote on here on my notes, like story over stats. Do you have like a process that you go through to, to like choose what story will, you know, impact that audience more, you know, something that you personally go through, like when you're selecting your stories? This is a great question. And this is actually one of my favorite things about developing a talk is it's something that us in like Successor Academy and Action Era and businesses and call your content vault. So as you are moving through like the world as a person, right, we have these experiences that a lot of times we write off because it's just kind of part of the human experience. But these everyday experiences we go through, we can use on stage and we can attach a message to it. So what I suggest is creating like a list of messages that resonate with you that you wanna share with the world and then start paying attention to what happens to you every day. Uh, so like one example I use a lot of this is I used to swim competitively. And then as an adult, I was like, I wanna start swimming again. And I hate early mornings and I hate early mornings even more with, without caffeine. So I go to swim and I had like my head down and the pool I go to is where like all the competitive swimmers go in Vegas. And my head down, I'm like, just get in the lane, it's fine. Well, this short Asian man jumps out in front of me and I don't even know where he came from. And he's like, what are you doing outside of the water? Go get in the lane. I'm like, why are you yelling at me at 6 a.m.? Like that seems unnecessary. So I go and I get in the water and I start swimming, but I think about it, right? I thought about just this random encounter and how positive that it was, right? What are you doing stalling, right? What are you doing not going towards your goal? Why are you thinking you need to keep your head down, right? Why are you trying to act timid when you know you own the space? All of these messages, I could put with that story. And it was just a random freaking thing that happened to me, right? But also we talk to our friends all the time. If something random happens during the day, we call our friends or we text them, oh my God, bro, I gotta tell you this story, right? And that's who we are as people. So I take those stories and I start looking at them and then I attach messages to them. So you don't have to go through like a big tragedy or a big change to have a valid story attached to a message that can make an impact on stage. I like that. I like the start, the content vault. I, uh, I'm pretty organized in all aspects of my life, but whenever it comes to those personal stories, it's like kind of goes to the wayside, you know, you just keep going about your day, but yeah, if you had the little content vault in Notion or something like that, I could see that being useful. So, okay, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Okay, Keisha, what do we do if there's no Q&A? Now what? Um, someone unmuted themselves. Maybe they have a question. Carlisle, perhaps, do you have a question? Okay, maybe not. Okay. So if there's not no questions anymore, we will head on to the gratitude circle. So if anyone would like to share any takeaways that you had on this event, or if you want to give your appreciation to our speaker for today, please feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself. Thank you for your time, John. I, okay. All right, well, personally, I would like to thank you, Sarah, because um, it's true. I agree with, uh, Ro Ro with what Ron said, that your talk is very detailed and well-structured, just like uh, what you've mentioned in your talk. It really helped me with uh, my hosting, hosting and um, organizing the IN event as well. I think it gives me a... Uh, the, the speaker's point of view and how also we can collaborate with the speakers better. So I really appreciate that talk. Thanks. And we have more hands. Brenda? Oh, I just want to thank Sarah. Uh, what my takeaway is, is with respect to speaking with your soul. 
And I can really relate to you talking about not, not relying on PowerPoints because it's a disconnect to the audience. And so it's just a, a good, re good reminder and something to practice. So thank you for that. You're welcome. How about you, Lisa? Thank you, Brenda. I was going to say the same thing that Peter just wrote in the chat there about the volunteering aspect of it, because a lot of times I find like I enjoy volunteering and putting my time out there, but I never really think about it in this sense. Right. I, I don't really think about it as putting myself in a group to volunteer in order to. You know, network better with other people inside of that group, I always just think of it as just going out and volunteering and not a and nothing more than that, right? So it's it's good to think of it that way because then you're giving something of yourself. It's not just you taking, taking, and it's like a giver's gain, which I think is great. So thank you for that tip. You're welcome. Thank you, Lisa. I totally agree with that. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for showing up at today's event and for sticking through the end of the call. And our next event is going to be on July 11th, 2023 at 4 p.m. Pacific, still the same time. And we are going to have Jay Fair Brother talking about creating a high impact six figure program revenue. So to sign up for that, you can go to the URL or the link that I will put in the chat box. Yeah. Oh, Tasha, would you like to say anything? Oh, maybe it's just a mistake. That... Okay. <laughs> Sorry, that was a mistake. Oh, it's okay. All right. Again, thank you so much, Sarah, for giving us your wonderful talk. And thank you, everyone, for being here on the call. And we will see you on the next one. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.